tonight will be um, some time to continue to learn a little bit more about Ben's story and about the kinds of things he's talking about. He's been so involved in these areas that I wanted him to be able to begin to share and help us understand how we could take some first steps and second and even third steps to be a part of what it is that he's describing. And so uh, I'm glad that you're here to be a part of this. As we move uh, a little bit later in our time together this evening, uh, please write down some questions. Uh, that you want to ask him. No question is out of bounds or, or uh, unimportant. And so write those down so that you can ask your question around this topic so that we can really discern as a people here at TFC, how, do, how are we faithful to this significant central part of the gospel? Um, and so get ready to ask those, and we'll have a good time of interaction uh, towards, the, uh, towards the end of our time together this evening. Just to let you know, uh, when it comes to um, uh, participating in community worship in the morning, uh, in terms of like Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, as well as the evening, um, the expectation when we sign in and that kind of thing is that you're here for the entirety of the experience. And so in the morning, yep, that's from 10 to 1045. And in the evenings, that's from 6 to 7. And so please keep that in mind, integrity-wise, as you uh, have scanned and as uh, you have come to, to be a part of this evening. Most important thing that I want to say is we really are trying to, to make the case and to practice what it means to worship together. Um, And so one of the things that I want to say to all of us is that our worship here at TFC as a community is not whole. Uh, It's not what it needs to be unless as we come to this place that we join together, each and every one of us, and begin to practice worship together. Uh, as we seek as a community, uh, not just to be a beautiful sound uh, to the Lord, but truly to worship Him in spirit and in unity and in truth. And so what you do in this next hour is central to the quality of the worship experience that we have together. And so I want to invite you not just to sit back, but to actually give yourself to it and to participate. Good to see you, Anna. All right? All right, I'm going to open us in prayer. We have a special treat this evening. Grant Wall is a new professor in our music department. He's going to lead us tonight in a couple of songs in a time of musical, uh, a musical expression of worship. And so I'm excited to have him here. Um, I'm going to open us in prayer, and he will lead us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the work that you're doing in Jesus Christ by the power of your spirit. And we're thankful, Lord, that that is something big, this power that you've let loose in the world that's not only changing me and these folks gathered here, but us as a community. And Lord, has its sights set on the transformation of creation. God, help us not just to understand it, but to give ourselves to living into your gospel in such a way that by the power of your spirit, we begin to practice here and now where it is that you're taking all of creation itself so that we might bear witness to the truth of the gospel. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And the people of TFC said, amen. Amen. I want to invite you to stand this evening. Grant, great to have you. The Apostle Paul wrote these words in Colossians chapter 1, one of the great Christological passages of the New Testament. And he closes that passage and he says, For in him, in Christ, all the fullness of God, was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Let's celebrate and, and sing together about the power of the cross tonight. Would you lift your voices with me? Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day, Christ on the road to Calvary, tried by sinful men, torn and beaten then, nailed to a cross of wood. This the power of the cross, Christ became sin for us, took the blame, bore the wrath, we stand forgiven at the cross. Oh, 
want to see the pain written on your face, bearing the awesome weight of sin. Every bitter thought, every evil deed, crowning your blood-stained brow. This the power of the cross. Christ became sin for us. Took the blame for the wrath we stand forgiven at the daylight flees now the ground beneath quakes as its maker bows his head curtain torn in two dead are raised to life finished the victory cry is the power of the cross. Christ became sin for us, took the blame for the wrath we stand forgiven at the cross. written in the world for through your suffering I am free death is crushed to death life is mine to live won through your selfless love this is the power of the cross, Son of God, slain for us. What a love, what a cost, we stand forgiven at the Aren't you glad we don't have to clean ourselves up before we approach the cross? Amen. Come out of sadness from wherever you've been. Come broken hearted, let rescue begin. Come find your mercy, O oh sinner, come near. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your face. hope for the hopeless and all those who strayed 
Come sit at the table, come taste the grace. There's rest for the weary, a rest that endures. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't cure. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your face. Oh, wanderer, come home, you're not too far. So lay God, we come before you tonight thanking you that we can approach your throne of grace boldly tonight, not because of anything that we bring with us, but God, we brought nothing to the cross but filthy rags of heinous sin and a darkened heart. But God, there you clothed us in the righteousness of your Son. And so we stand before your throne this evening boldly, forgiven, and so grateful. So God, I pray tonight that we would live in the glorious light of your gospel we would live victorious over the sin from which you have set us free. God, may the conduct of our lives and the thoughts of our heart, the desires of our life bring honor to you. That is our prayer tonight. I pray that the worship of your people would be a sweet fragrance to you tonight. God, as we open your word and hear the message that you have for us tonight, I pray that you would give us ears to hear, that we would receive your word, and that we would apply it to our life, and that we would be disciples for you in light and salt in Tocoa, Georgia, and wherever you lead us. And all of these things we pray in the name that is above every name, yeah. the name at which yeah. every knee will bow and every tongue confess Jesus. that he is Lord. Lord. God, we pray in the precious name of your son, Jesus, yes. our Savior.
invite you to be seated. You got to know Ben Lowe a little bit this morning. I'm going to ask him to come. I share with you this morning that Ben graduated from Wheaton University where um, he majored um, and got a degree in environmental biology. Um, in the 10 years following his graduation from Wheaton, he was in the nonprofit sector working with a number of groups. I spoke about some of those this morning, the Evangelical Environment Network as well as um, Yaka, I love that, I love that. Young Evangelicals for Climate Action, as well as uh, Evangelicals for Social um, Action. Um, and so he's been involved in that nonprofit sector in terms of working towards the things that we talked about this morning. How can we be good stewards of the creation? He's also a graduate student at the University of Florida in the School of Natural Resources and Environment. One of the things that uh, I really respect, uh, it's... Each person has to discern their particular kind of way and how they will engage. But one of the things I, I love about Ben is that uh, he's going right in the heart of, of a, a secular kind of education with, with biologists and ecologists and lots of different folk. And he's getting credentialed as well as preparing himself in order to, to speak into those significant kinds of ways. Listen to his dissertation. He's uh, focusing on tropical conservation and development. That's crazy. Yeah, tropical conservation and development. And his research is on the human dimensions of fisheries management uh, on Lake Tanganyika. Is that right? That's close. Yeah, not at all. In East Africa, all right? And therefore, he's getting involved in the field. And one of the things I love about that is there's something missionary and missional about what he's doing. Uh, we believe that um, the best place to understand stewardship of creation is when we're inhabiting the biblical story. That's where it actually finds its home and its place. And here has been in the midst of lots and lots of conversations going on at the world level. And as he's doing so and relating to them in their own fields, he's where he is in order to bear witness to the fact that he is in, in, interested in climate change because it's at the heart of the Christian gospel. And he looks for opportunities to share how that reality finds its home within the biblical story. So I think that's cool, Ben. I'm glad that you're here to share with us a little bit about your story and to help us begin to flesh out how do we begin to respond to this part of the gospel? How do we get involved and how can we become faithful in this area? Thanks, Chris. Let's hear it for Ben. Um, any of you read Wendell Berry? Okay, I love Wendell Berry's writings. I've never met him, and at this point, I'm starting to lose opportunities. But one of the things that he wrote, I'm paraphrasing, is you can't practice virtue without skill. I think he phrased it as a question. How can you practice virtue without skill? And that really got my attention, because for the last 10 years, I've been working with a lot of churches and campuses and communities around this country to talk about why caring for God's creation is a biblical virtue. And I really felt compelled to go back to school to develop more expertise or skills in actually doing it so that I'd be able to talk out of the things that I'm doing. And I could show, instead of just tell people, I could show them what I mean by the work that we would do in the world. And so that's why I went back to the University to University of Florida in this case, because I wanted to find a really top-notch program, and UF is doing great work in this area, in case any of you are interested. And I wanted to find a really top-notch advisor in the field that I want to study. And my advisor has been doing this for decades, and she's just really at the top of her game. And I figured that I wasn't going to worry about whether they were Christian. Um, and that, that, as a missionary kid, was where I wanted to be. Um, and, and a community surrounded by people who care about God's creation but might not yet know God. Uh, and I've been very grateful for this last, I'm a year and a half into the program now, and I'm looking at another oh, four and a half years probably um, to get the PhD at the end. So it's a, it's a long haul, but it's been really good. It's been a great place to be for me. And that's part of what I want to talk to you about tonight. I want to talk to you about climate change because um, I think this is a tough issue in the church. I don't think it. I know it. I've experienced how tough this issue is in the church. And, and it was tough for me, too. 
Um, and I've talked a lot about it now for a number of years. And I felt like I just couldn't come here and spend two days with you talking about caring for creation and leave without providing some space to engage around the issue of climate change. And so we're going to do that now. And I'm going to share what I, I want to do this in the form of sharing part of my testimony. And I'll share more of my testimony tomorrow. This morning I talked a lot about what the Bible has to say and how this is part of the gospel. Um, and now what I want to share with you about is how God has worked that through in my life to bring me to the place that I'm at. So we're going we're gonna to focus on climate change and do that now, and then we'll talk more about this stuff more broadly tomorrow morning. Um, and that way we can have time for interaction. If you have questions, a follow-up, a heartburn, or whatever it is, that we can talk about it, we can discuss it instead of just me flinging things at you and then walking away, um, which, you know, has its place too. But um, I'm a missionary kid. I was born and raised in Singapore. And my mom's Malaysian and my dad's Caucasian American, so I'm biracial, which has presented me with all sorts of identi identity crises through the years. Um, but I grew up in Singapore, and then I moved to the United States when I was 16 years old. My dad became a pastor at a Chinese church outside of Boston, and I finished up high school, public school in Singapore to public school in America. That's a really jarring transition. Um, it was my job in Singapore as the head prefect, um, if any of you watch Harry Potter, I haven't, but I hear that concept is, is there. Uh, it was my job to decide who got caned. Yeah. So we're talking about very different educational systems here. And, and you should have seen me for the last two years of high school in America trying to fit in without really much help. Um, but <laughs> that's a lot of, that's a whole nother story for another time. Uh, but I, I grew up in the American Evangelical Church. Um, and in Singapore, it was a little different. It was the Evangelical Church, but it had a kind of a different flavor, a different culture to it than it does here. But then it, there was a lot of overlap, too. And then I, I came over here, and, and I transitioned to being a pastor's kid in a big evangelical church and was in that community. And then I went to Wheaton College, which is a very proud evangelical institution of higher education. And... I realized a few things growing up. One is that I was a Republican. And I'm not going to talk a lot about politics here, but climate gets political, and so I want to get it out, and I want to try to frame it and then move us past that. But I realized I had to be a Republican. Um, I didn't know if I was, but I knew I was supposed to be because my father has always voted Republican, and my grandfather always voted Republican, and his father, who I never met, always voted Republican. So um, that was part of my heritage and I assumed part of my identity. Um, and I also knew that Republicans and conservatives had a very uneasy relationship as of late around environmental issues. And climate change probably was at the top of the list of things that just really weren't very settling for my political community. Um, and so I entered into Wheaton College that way. And I was a junior environmental biology major and I had avoided thinking about climate change. Three years I was at Wheaton as an environmental biology major. I was studying ecology. And somehow I was very effectively able to say, you know, because I was a pastor's kid. Are there any pastor's kids here? Okay. Um, so we either go either way, right? We're either good or bad. And you hear that from everybody, oh, you're a good pastor's kid. And if you're a bad pastor's kid, you just don't hear it from people, right? They don't say, oh, you're a, they're just like, oh, dear. Um, so I was trying to be the good pastor's kid, the one that didn't cause my parents more trouble already than they had on their hands in a, in a large church. And so I got really good at avoiding controversy and conflict. I got really good at that. And when I started majoring in environmental bi biology, I realized climate change had controversy and conflict all over it. So I avoided it, and I got good at it. Um, but as I was going through my education, I got an opportunity the summer in between junior and senior year to go to Lake Tanganyika, um, which is one of the, Afri the great African the African Great Lakes, it's a, it's a Rift Valley Lake, it's in East Africa. It's bordered by Tanzania, the DR Congo, Burundi, and Zambia. And it's the second deepest lake in the world. 
it holds up to around 18% of the world's available unfrozen fresh water at any given time. The first deepest lake in the world is Lake Baikal in Russia. Um, and it has over 400 species of fish, many of which are endemic, which means they are found in no other lake in the world. It is a remarkably cool place. And if you're, I love fishing, and I love fish. I love to study them, watch them, eat them, catch them. Like, I don't know what it is about fish. I'm just grateful that the disciples were fisher people because that makes me feel a little bit better about my weird obsession about this fish. I don't know. Some people are all about birds. Some people are all about trees. I'm all about fish. So I really wanted to go to this lake. I thought it'd be fascinating. And I found an opportunity. The National Science Foundation was funding a research project on Lake Tanganyika. And they were asking for student researchers who wanted to apply to get research training. And I applied, and I got it. And I went to Lake Tanganyika. And for a summer, I lived on the shores of Lake Tanganyika in a city town called Kigoma. And I got paid to work with the most amazing fish I had ever seen in my life. I got paid to go scuba diving, which is, you know, all fun and games until you get a parasite and have explosive diarrhea and are 30 feet underwater with a wetsuit on and it hits you. And then what do you do? I'm not sure. What do you do? I didn't find a good answer to that question. <laughs> I also got malaria. I got, you know, I, I had a good time. Um, I lost a lot of weight. <laughs> But we were studying, so this, this is a really important lake surrounded by four countries, and one of the biggest ecosystem services that offered the communities around the lake was the fishery. A lot of people depended on the fishery for their livelihoods, for their jobs, as well as for a major source of protein. So it was a very important fishery for the region, and it was a very poor and undeveloped, underdeveloped region. Um, the problem was the fishery had been declining. It had been declining very quickly and steadily, consistently. And so there was a lot of concern about this. And so they had been sending teams of scientists to study, and they actually thought it was an issue of sedimentation. There had been a lot of deforestation on the shore. They thought the erosion of the, the soil washing into the lake was covering the breeding sites of a lot of the cichlids and other species of fish in the shallows, and that was causing... Their, um, that was affecting their reproduction and recruitment and causing the fishery to decline. But what they actually found was that Lake Tanganyika was losing its nutrient supply. And I'm sorry, I'm in grad school now, so I complicate things, and I've lost the ability, apparently, to explain this concisely. But I'm going to try. And the story is... Lake Tanganyika is a super deep lake, right? Most of the bottom levels don't have any oxygen in them. So life lives in the surface levels of the layers of the lake. But the bottom is where all the nutrients are. And the nutrients need to get to the top to replenish the nutrients in the top so that the phytoplankton, the zooplankton can grow and reproduce, and so that the little fish and whatever can eat them, and then the big fish eat them, and then we catch the big fish and eat them, you know? So what happens in these lakes, and you can see it to some extent in the Great Lakes here in the U.S., is these seasonal winds blow across Lake Tanganyika. And they blow consistently and strongly enough that they actually push the water and back it up. It's like a finger lake. It's really long and narrow. So they'll back it up. And when they do that, it brings water from the, the depths, the anoxic depths without oxygen, but lots of nutrients, and it brings that water up to the surface. So it causes the lake to mix. And that's how it sustains a vibrant fishery, by replenishing those nutrients. But what was happening is there was a regional warming of temperatures that was causing the seasonal winds to decrease and, not, and be much more intermittent. They just weren't blowing as much anymore. So the mixing energy was not there. At the same time, that over time, that those warmer air temperatures were getting into the water column and making it harder for the water column to mix. It was stratifying it more. And so it, would, it took more energy to mix at the same time that there was less energy available being inputted into the system. And so what happened was fewer nutrients were making it to the surface levels. And so the fishery was declining. You could have the same fishing pressure and the fishery would still decline. But we don't have the same fishing pressure because this is one of the, the 
parts of the world with the highest population growth rates. And it's very politically unstable in a lot of parts of it. And so people are flocking to the lake at the same time that you've got this undercutting. It's just a really bad news situation, isn't it? Uh, and the fishery was declining. And I remember being, when it was big news when they figured this out and they published a lot of papers out of it and people challenged it. And then so they went back and, and did more studies and they've been publishing, a big paper came out last year to really try to figure out is this the signal we're getting. Science is a very skeptical process. So it takes a lot of work to get people on board with this idea. Uh, and, and that's what it's all pointing to right now. But I remember distinctly one day I was standing on a, a landing site, a fishing beach, as these folks paddled their dugout canoes with the nets in it and the catch from that night. And we were sorting through, we are talking with them, interviewing them on how they were fishing, what they were catching, and looking at their catch to try to keep some records so we could measure change over time. And, and the fisherman said, look, he said this in Swahili. But I'll say it to you in English. He said, look, I've been fishing, my family has fished here for generations, and I am not catching the fish that we used to anymore. This is a really big problem for us. What's going on? What do I need to do? And I thought, oh, I, I heard about the ants. I know what's going on. I can tell them. And so here I am trying to explain climate change. I already kind of didn't do a very good job with you guys, but imagine trying to explain it to someone whose first language is not English and who I don't have enough Swahili to communicate at that level. Even now I don't. Um, and so we were going back and forth, and I was trying to explain climate change and why that's, he wasn't catching as much fish. And he said, okay, never mind. Just tell me what to do about it. And I had nothing for him. Because I realized that what he could do about it that the solutions to this issue were far larger than him. And he had so few resources as is. What could he do about it? The best thing he could do about it, honestly, was to find another kind of job, another livelihood. But that's really scarce in that area. I had nothing for him. But you know what that experience did for me? It made me realize that this issue of climate change, one, it's not in many cases, it's not just an issue down the road. It's an issue that's happening now. And it's not just an issue that's affecting polar bears. It's an issue that's affecting this fisherman who's talking to me, who I'm looking at face-to-face -face on a landing beach in Kigoma, Tanzania. And I realize that I could afford, because of my privileged status, I could afford to ignore it, to go back to the United States and go back to my previous strategy of just not dealing with and worrying about climate change. But I also knew that personally, I couldn't face God and do that. I felt like that would lack integrity. I would not be faithful. I was given this experience and this story and I needed to do something with it. I felt very strongly convicted, especially through prayer after that, that when I came back, I needed to think about what I thought about climate change. I needed to face up to this political boogie thing, and deal with it, and then figure out how to talk about it with my community. And so that's what I did. And it's not always been fun or easy, but I've spent the last almost 13 years working within the church about, all right, let's talk about climate change. Yes, no, 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 I don't want to talk about Al Gore. God bless him. Let's just not worry about Al Gore. Let's talk about climate change and what's going on. And let's just, let's put the politics aside for a little bit and let's talk about science and theology. And, you know, over this, over the course of this time, I started out working with a lot of conservation organizations. But by the end, you know who I was working with the most? It was the relief and development organizations. It was groups like World Vision and Tear Fund and Food for the Hungry and Bread for the World. Do you know why? Because in the words of one of their executive directors, Climate change is one of the biggest challenges we in the relief and development community are dealing with in many parts of the world today because it's undoing the progress that we've been able to make to get people access to clean water and healthy food and stable ecosystems, environments in which to sustain their livelihoods. 
So I've been working with relief and development organizations because these issues, they're so, they're so interdisciplinary. It's not just an environmental issue. It's a people issue. It's a social justice issue. It's an issue that the person currently bearing far greater impacts are people, fishermen on Lake Tanganyika, who are really responsible for far less pollution and far less of the cause of what's, what's changing around the world today. And things are changing fast. And we're seeing, you know, we can look at the natural world and we can see it. We're seeing species moving. Their patterns are moving. Migration patterns are moving. Species ranges are moving according to different shifting temperature patterns. I'm going to throw, I'm not going to do this for long, but I'm going to throw some numbers at you. Um, the Earth has warmed since 1880. A lot of the warming has occurred since 1970. The 1980s were the hottest decade on record until the 1990s. And then they were the hottest decade on record until the 2000s. And then they were the hottest decade on record. The last, well, let's see, the 10 hottest years on record currently have all happened since 1998. 2014 broke the record. World's hottest year ever. Then, well, you know, since we've been keeping record. Then 2015 broke that record. And then 2016 became the hottest year. We're just breaking records left and right here. The last below average temperature month, globally speaking, was February of 1985. How many of you were, sorry, professors, I won't ask that question. But when I thought of how many of us were born before that, I realized most of our generation, I don't know if we're in the same generation anymore, but most of our generation, Orshans, were born after February of 1985. I was actually born in 1984. But the reality is most of our lives have been lived in a world that's been warming, where climate change has just been the increasing reality. That is almost 400 consecutive months of above average global temperatures without a break. At what point do we step back and say, okay, that seems to be a trend. <laughs> 400 consecutive months above the, 19th, the, the 20th century, the 1900s average temperature. Also, I work a lot on fisheries, marine, aquatic stuff. The oceans are now 30% more acidic than they were before the Industrial Revolution. That's freaky. So we see these signs coming through, these signals coming through in all different ways, and it all adds up and points to the same picture. And so there's where we are. And we understand the Bible says we're to care for creation and we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. And so we're faced with this uncomfortable reality of in our society today, in our communities, in our churches, and in our political whatever we want to call it, we got to figure out how to move forward faithfully. And it's not easy. And it's confusing and complicated. But we can't avoid it. That's what I learned from being on Lake Tanganyika. You know, I, um, I'm doing my graduate work on Lake Tanganyika. You might remember that from the introduction. You know why? Because when I started thinking about grad school, I thought, what, what part of the world do I really feel called to be in solidarity with right now? And for me, because of the experiences God had given me, it was being back there on Lake Tanganyika, working with those fishermen, going back after 10 years of being here and working here, going back there and figuring out, all right, what do we do now? And my whole project is looking at how the fishing communities are adapting to the changes that they're already experiencing and how we can try to help them adapt in sustainable ways versus unsustainable ways that just make things a lot worse. And I don't, uh, we'll see if we find good answers. It's a really messy situation. But... I was there this whole past summer. I was there on Lake Tanganyika. Didn't have explosive diarrhea this time. We made it out. But um, I, was, I was on the, in the markets, and I was asking the price of the fish. Samaki hini begani. And the answer was really, the answer was they were at least twice as expensive as they used to be before because there are, far fewer fish than they used to be before. This is affecting real lives. And I know, what, I, know I can't avoid it anymore. And, and I don't want the church to ignore it either. And I don't think we can. So very quickly, I, um, what's, what's going on? 
the, the general scientific consensus is that two degrees Celsius of warming is probably all we want to talk about. That's probably the, if we don't want to cause dramatic changes. Two degrees doesn't sound like much until you think about this is the global average change. So we're talking about some places getting a lot hotter, some places getting a lot colder, a lot drier, a lot wetter. I mean, we're, we're averaging this. And so two degrees starts to get to be pretty significant. So if we want to keep it to two degrees, we've already warmed about three quarters of a degree and pushing. Um, then they calculated our carbon budget, the amount of pollution that we can continue to put up in the atmosphere that will cause it to warm further. We have 565 gigatons of carbon that we can continue to emit. That's their estimate, their guess. We've already accounted, as of this year, for that amount. There are 2,795 or more at this point gigatons of fossil fuel, of carbon in the fossil fuel reserves that we already have on hand. We have that, we have five times more than our budget that we could burn tomorrow if that's what we chose to do. And we don't have a track record of not burning stuff that we already have on hand. We seem to burn it all. So this is a little bleak. Now what needs to happen? I just in, in three movements. The first is what we call mitigation. That's how do we reduce the amount of pollution we're putting up into the atmosphere? How do we try to slow and start to stabilize the climate? Um, and the second, now that's, that's a really tough question because that means doing things like putting a price on pollution. This is actually a very conservative approach to taxes and, and policy. Uh, and I work very closely. One of my friends, Bob Inglis, is a former Republican congressman from South Carolina. He travels all around the country talking about a carbon fee and dividend idea, which would help put a price on pollution. Basically, I know this is sim simplifying it a lot, if you want less of something, you tax it. And if you want more of something, you incentivize it. That's why we tax cigarettes, alcohol, gambling. Um, and they also raise revenue for other things, of course, when we tax those. And then, and then of course, the arguments about, well, then if you tax pollution, then let's remove income tax, or let's reduce income tax, and, and that sort of thing. So the first thing we need to do is we need to figure out how to mitigate this pollution. The second thing that we need to do is we need to figure out how to adapt to what we're already experiencing and what we're already committed to. And for us as Christians, I really believe that what we need to focus on is the situation that a lot of the poor are in around the world because those are the ones who have the least resources to adapt. A lot of our communities are going to be able to adapt. Now, Gainesville is going to be able to adapt. Miami, that's another story. Sea level is rising, and they're already trying to figure out how to re-engineer parts of their city because of the flooding and the saltwater intrusion. But we need to adapt, and that's why... Before I went back to grad school, I was doing a lot more work with the Humanitarian Disaster Institute, which is a new institute out of Wheaton College, and they're trying to figure out what it means for the church to engage around disaster response. So mitigation, adaptation, and in order to really mobilize the resources that we need to do, we need to mobilize to do both of those things, we need some sort of moral movement, something that will raise this issue up to the level that it needs to be to get attention from the people who make decisions. And that's where groups like Young Evangelicals for Climate Action came in. We founded Young Evangelicals for Climate Action because we were complaining and complaining and complaining about this inaction going on, and we figured, you know what? Let's take responsibility. Let's see what we can do. And so we formed this group. And our goal was to engage with our senior church leaders and get them thinking about it. And our goal was to engage with our political leaders and get them thinking about it. And then our goal was to engage with our generation and get us mobilized. Because we're inheriting this thing. And we're going to deal with it for the rest of our lives. So what does it mean to be faithful here? Um, there's a short two-minute video on YECA just to give you a sense of some of the things we've been about. Is that something we can play now? Or... Ah, there we go.
obviously there's a lot more that we could talk about there, but whatever time we have left, I'd like to open it up to any questions that you might have or any comments you'd like to make. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, that's a, that's a big question, and um, if I don't answer it thoroughly enough, just let me know, give me your email or something, and I'll shoot you more information later. But yeah, the climate has always changed. It's always been changing. But here's the thing. We have designed our societies to live within these very specific current climate regimes. So when we disrupt that, then it's causing a lot more havoc than it would have before. We're also seeing the climate changing a lot more than before, and the cause of this change seems to be driven, very clearly driven, by our production of pollution, which, have gone, again, is happening at a rate that's never happened before. Either. So we have this big global experiment. Yeah, the climate has always been changing, but we've never been in this place before with this many people this vulnerable and with this much that we're doing to, to power it. Um, so the best projections that we have are somewhat distressing and bleak, which is another reason I believe the church needs to be engaged on this because there's a lot of despair and a lot of anger and bitterness and discouragement. And we have hope, and we have joy, and we respond in love. And that's really needed today in, in that movement. So I know that's a very tight answer to what's a very big question. And there's a lot of data that can be thrown at that to show you exactly. There's some great graphs I can send you. So if you want to know more, just let me know afterwards, and I can do that. But thanks for the question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, why do so many Christians today miss the points of creation, courage, part of the gospel? Um, there are a lot of reasons. I actually just finished a chapter for a book, and our chapter in the book was on the different scriptures that Christians use to say that we don't need to care about this stuff. Uh, that was very depressing research for me. <laughs> but, um, and I'll talk more about this tomorrow, but... My mentor, Peter Harris, uh, he was the founder of Arasha, the organization I mentioned in chapel this morning. He said to me once something that, that really got my attention. He said, you know, Ben, a lot of people are worried about GMOs, genetically modified organisms. You know, when you take the DNA of something and then you spice it and you mix it up and you have salmon that grow three times as fast and as large and that sort of thing. Uh, and there's a lot of our stuff now is G GMO'd. But... Um, he said, I really think Christians should be worrying about a GM church, a genetically modified church, where we have so patched in our surrounding culture uncritically, individualism, narcissism, consumerism, in some cases nationalism, all these other isms into our reading of the gospel that we are not living or teaching the biblical gospel any longer. And as an ordained minister in the Alliance, I work with a lot of churches where I see this all the time where our faith, our churches, sometimes a lot of it's cultural Christianity. And sometimes it's not that harmful. Sometimes it is really harmful. But what it always is, is it's not what the Bible is calling us to. Like you can see how we've moved off. And I think there needs to be a renewal movement across the United States and in most countries where Christianity is the majority religion because we get into that, you know, that becomes a little bit, we get, become too complacent and we, we don't distinguish between the gospel and the rest of our lives and world very, very well. So the problem is that's a far bigger issue than just creation care. Creation care is just a manifestation of what's also affecting how we interact with immigrants and the poor and homeless people, how we interact around human sexuality and identi gender identity issues and, and all sorts of things in between. But I think a lot of it comes down to that. Yeah.
Oh, yeah. For sure. Yeah, well, um, so that's another big question um, in terms of is this issue, especially climate, being taken or potentially taken advantage of by corporations or groups, interest groups with interest in, in promoting this stuff? And the answer is, yeah, there's always that risk. But let me tell you, if someone were able to debunk climate science, they would make so much money and be, I mean, they would just... They'd be sainted by every community in the world. Like, so, you know, um, we do have to be careful about what we call greenwashing. It's where people hype up environmental concerns and say that, well, we're doing all this great stuff to help address it, and so buy our product because we're environmentally friendly, that sort of thing. And so we have to make sure they're really doing good and not just saying they're doing good. There are also people who are trying to take advantage of, oh, we see the future of energy is not going to be fossil fueled. No matter what we do, coal is going to struggle more, and it's going to start being outcompeted as technology increases and as innovation increases by things like solar and wind or geothermal in different parts of the country and world. So we're going to invest in that and take advantage of it that way, and in which case I go, great, you do that because we need to build momentum towards coming up with more efficient solar and, and wind and geothermal energy that has a smaller environmental footprint. So I think, yeah, it's, we, have to be, we have to be as wise as ser serpents and as innocent as doves. And I'm sorry, this is all really complicated. And sometimes you'll think you're doing something good and you realize that you've been tricked or you really what you were doing that people said would make a difference really wasn't that effective. And that's really frustrating. And I've run into that problem too. But it can't keep us from still pushing forward and trying to do our best. We talked about a definition of stewardship in one of the classes today. And I don't know about this. I just came up with this in my mind. But stewardship is making the right decisions with the best information you have at the moment. I think that's what, that's what God's going to hold us accountable for. What did you know and what did you do with what you know or what you had? I'm not sure God's going to hold us accountable for what we didn't know and had no way of of knowing. So I want to figure out what we know and what we have, and I want to do what I can with it now. And as more information comes in, I need to remain open to growing and changing and getting better. And if that means saying, oops, and going a different direction, then that's what I need to do too. Because at the end of the day, this is, I mean, it's not about us, right? It's about God and what God wants in the world. And we're very fallible. Sorry, hard question, but yeah. Um, for someone who doesn't really understand this stuff, uh, for someone who doesn't really understand uh, climate change and that kind of stuff, how would you suggest starting to learn about that? There is a great, um, there is a great booklet that's put out by the National Association of Evangelicals. If you go to nae.net, it's titled "Loving the Least of These," and it's basically a conversation piece. They put a lot of Science, Christians who are in science doing climate work, they pulled a lot of R&D, relief and development folks. They pulled a lot of policy folks, all these folks and theologians together. And they said, let's put out a resource that kind of gives an overview of what this is and why and how it matters to us. And that's what they did. So you can download it from their website. That'd be a great place to start. Another place to start that would be really easy is to go to Young Evangelicals for Climate Action, yecaction.org, and they've got a resources page where they've kind of collated a, the things that they found, we found, they found most. I got too old to be considered a Young Evangelical anymore. Isn't that sad? It's awkward. Um, so, sorry, you're not in it either anymore at this point. Uh, <laughs> so, that would be a great place to go, yecaction.org. If you, if you have trouble remembering, it's Young Evangelicals for Climate Action, Y-E-C-A, which is like Y-M-C-A, but with an E. How would you do that? Why? Oh, gosh. That was suggested. They're like, do that, do that. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I once heard... Sorry, I wow, that's word. loud. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. That was I, me. I know how to project. I know how to project, so uh, I know how to project, Go. so... I once heard once that uh, this theory that this woman told me, um, she made clear that it was a theory, she, she wasn't sure about herself, but she was reading like the end times and stuff like that, and she noticed verses that made her have this thought, 
Hmm. What if, like, during the end times, like, um, things just get so bad climate wise and like she paid attention to versus like um creation groaning and uh sure. stuff like that do you think there is a chance that um that um <laughs> bad stuff with climate and environment and all this stuff might might play into um the end times maybe yeah so i've i've heard that a good bit from a lot of um my sisters and brothers and um I think there are many different ways of reading Revelation, and, and that's one distinct way of, of reading it. Um, I would encourage folks who have questions about that to th talk to theology professors on this campus or take some of those classes. I think Mr. Stratton has is, is thought about these issues a little, quite a bit too. Um, and how we read Revelation is very important. You know, understanding the genre and understanding the authorial intent and understanding that all of that stuff and what we get out of it. But here's the thing, okay, regardless of how we choose to interpret some of those things and whether we think they're pointing towards potentially the end times, I really don't think it changes our responsibility because the parables that Jesus left us with in the Gospels, are a lot of them have to do with stewardship. Who's the wise servant versus the foolish servant? Who's the, and there are other, you know, parables. It's the one who was prepared, who was doing the work that the Father left, left us before. So I think when God comes back, I want to be doing the work that he asked me to do. And, and if something in the atmosphere is pointing towards his return, I don't think that gives us any excuse to destroy the earth faster in the hopes that that would advance his return. Uh, you know, you, but you know how that logic could end up in a direction like that. So I think we need to be really careful. It's like, um, it's like if a lot of you will have children one day, God gives you a child, and you look, oh, what a great, beautiful gift from God, and then it hits you. This child is going to take a lot of my time and money. It's going to grow old, and one day it's going to die. What's the point? And so let's just leave the child out in the backyard and... No, that's just crazy. And it's the same with the earth. We need to take care of God's creation because we're following God the creator and, and trusting God and, and not, you know, let's be on the right side of this one. <laughs> yeah, but thanks for the question. Yeah. All right, we're, we're at the end for this evening. Uh, but if you don't want to stick around and ask some personal questions... Uh, for Ben, you can do so. Um, you can also check out his books that are up here if you like. He's got a great price on those where you can uh, flesh out some of the things that he's been talking about. But appreciate you being here this evening. Come and chat with Ben. Keep him up really late. I'm going home. All right? You can Bye, take Chris. it back up. So, so that's good. Thank you all for being here. We'll see you tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock.